What's up guys, Kudokun here. Today we're going to take a look at the second of the three big releases I was supposed to look at last month, Dissidia NT. Before we get started hot and heavy into this review, I need to say that I will be making some comparisons to both the arcade version of Dissidia and the PSP versions of Dissidia. For those who might not know, this version of Dissidia we have right now on the PS4 is based on an arcade cabinet that was released in Japan based on the Dissidia franchise. They essentially plucked the game from the arcade cabinet, polished it up, added a story mode, added some new features, and then released it on the PS4. So some of the complaints I have will be argued against by pointing out that it wouldn't have worked as well on the arcade cabinet. But my argument against that is they could have very easily changed a lot of that stuff with the PS4 port. They changed a lot of other stuff, they added a story mode, they added a bunch of new stuff to the PS4 version. They could have very easily changed any of the stuff that I have complaints about. Now about the PSP versions. I am a huge fan of Dissidia on the PSP. I've sunk at least 400 hours of my life into both Dissidia and Dissidia Duodecim. It is completely fair to say that you cannot expect this game to play like the old PSP games because the hardware was different, the specs were different, pretty much we're looking at two different classes of games, but the thing is they brought over a lot of stuff from the PSP versions and some of the stuff they brought over just doesn't work as well in the new Dissidia. So when I make a comparison, I'm not necessarily saying that they should have been on the same level, but if they are going to use so much stuff from the old games in the new game, then I think it's fair to point out when those new things just don't work. I know we've gone on for like two minutes and we haven't actually gotten to the game. Let's actually talk about Dissidia NT. The new graphics in the game, as you can imagine, are gorgeous. They look wonderful. All the character models look pretty amazing, all the environments look pretty amazing. The cutscenes for the story missions also look really really great. The only problem is of course the lip syncing, but of, like lip syncing is just going to get more and more of an issue and weeaboos are going to listen to it in Japanese anyway so I guess nobody really cares about the English lip syncing anymore. Overall the game aesthetically looks really nice, however they did do a couple of things that I don't really agree with. For one, and I know this is going to seem like the stupidest criticism in the world, but they took the custom boxes away. In the old Dissidia games, when you used an HP attack, you actually got a box around the name of your attack that was the exact same as the box in the game that it came from. I know it sounds like a lot to complain about something like this, but these little touches were part of what made Dissidia such a great crossover game. The Dissidia games were filled with items and references and stages and just all of this flavor from all of the games and they came together to create what is, in my opinion, one of the best crossover games ever. No matter what Final Fantasy game you liked, there was something unique about your favorite Final Fantasy that really stuck out. As small as these touches are, if you start losing that, if those touches start going away, if the love starts going away, this series is going to lose a lot of what made it so awesome. Another thing that's gone are the custom intros. In Dissidia and Dissidia Duodecim, you got these specialized intros depending on what character you were fighting and what character you were playing as. They would say something special to each other. I can fight without light. <laughs> Jeez, another lecture? Would you stop fidgeting? This guy's like a bad dream. <laughs> uh, sorry, that laugh one always gets me. Now I'll admit they did make up for this a bit in the online features because there are specialized chat messages for every one of the characters and they're all fully voice acted in both English and Japanese. It's a really great touch, I guess. Really would have liked both, but eh. Now this is a fighting game, so let's get on to the gameplay. For the uninformed, Dissidia Combat works like this. You have Bravery, which is the white number, and you have HP, which is the bar. Your bravery dictates how much damage you will deal to your opponent if you land an attack that hits their HP. You and your opponent trade blows with regular attacks, known as bravery attacks. Your number goes up, your opponent's number goes down, and then when you use a special move, known as an HP attack, 
it'll deduct your bravery directly out of the HP of the enemy that got hit. In the past it was one on one fighting, but they brought in 3v3 matches for online play now. You have 3 bravery attacks on the ground, 3 bravery attacks in the air, and normally 1 HP attack. In the past Dissidia games, when you looked over a character's bio, it would tell you about some kind of gimmick that that character had, and now the gimmicks for each of the characters have been placed on the triangle button instead of an EX burst. EX bursts were these old hyper combos that you could use, but they're gone from the game now, so don't worry too much about it. It's been replaced with summoning. Before each match, your team decides on which summoning they'd like to use. Each one gives different base stats. I pretty much always choose Shiva because she gives you more bravery. As the fight goes on, your summon bar will go up, and you can do this thing to summon the Duder, and they'll come out and they'll just lay this huge attack on your opponent that makes it easier for your team to win. You can also speed this process up by finding an EX core on the field somewhere and breaking it. Each team is given three lives, and every time one character on that team dies, that team loses one life and that player is revived. So hypothetically, you could take out each character one time, one character twice and another character once, or you could just pick on one character and take him out three times. One of your questions after I tell you this might be, um, Kudo, is there something stopping your team of three people from just picking one person on the opposing side and killing them three times over and over? Um, no. No, there isn't. In fact, that is one of the legitimate strategies that you can employ. This all sounds a bit simplistic and party game-ish, but to Dissidia Inti's credit, there's actually a lot more depth to the system when you start using it. Firstly, each character fits one of four different archetypes. Vanguards are your beefy frontline. They've got great stats, they're just meant to get in your face and stick to you. Assassins have low stats but great movement options, so they can be anywhere on the map they want to essentially, and they're really great at singling somebody out and keeping them out of a fight. Marksmen are characters that have very high attack but very low mobility, but they're ranged, so if your team is properly defending you, you could hypothetically be the highest damage dealer on your team. If your team is not defending you, however, then you'll be singled out by an assassin or a vanguard and killed very quickly. The fourth archetype, Specialist, kind of does its own thing. It's a character that doesn't fit into any particular archetype, and they normally have some kind of gameplay gimmick that's specific to only them. So the triangle works like this. Marksmen can take out vanguards because vanguards don't have any mobility. Vanguards can take out assassins because even though assassins can get in very quickly, they're just not as strong as the vanguards. Assassins can take out marksmen very quickly because they can close the distance and marksmen have no defense whatsoever, and specialists aren't a part of this at all. When you're in a fight, thinking on your feet about what your team is going to be good at is crucial to winning. And even though there's no complicated combos you have to learn or anything, learning the basics of the game is very important, and learning when to time specific moves is also very important. Learning when to use your triangle move, which ally to stick to, which enemy to fight, and when to use specific HP and bravery attacks is the key to winning. While the characters can start to feel a little bit samey if you're just button mashing, each of the characters does have something unique to them that makes them special, so if you're not liking the character you're playing, you'll probably be able to find something you like in a different character. Everything works pretty well. I can't help but be a little bit disappointed by how small and slow everything is now. The easiest comparison I could make is it's kind of like moving from melee to brawl. It's not a poorly executed game, it's just, you know, Dissidia Duo Deccan was like... <laughs> No hard feelings. This is it. It's not like there's anything wrong with the way the new city of plays. It's just different. It's not necessarily an acceptable substitute for the past Dissidias. Outside of the fighting, there's also a story mode, which was probably the biggest misstep. Now, I want to be clear about this. I love all of the characters from all the Final Fantasy games, and I get the biggest nerd boner when I get to see all of them together and interacting. My problem here isn't necessarily the story content itself. The story is pretty basic. 
a new set of gods have just summoned all of the Final Fantasy characters to do another battle royale, just like Cosmos and Chaos did before. It's a little dumber here because this time it's just essentially one goddess, and she just wants everybody to fight each other because that's how she powers her world's electricity or something? It's so frivolous. And then, like, another god shows up, and then they actually do the whole good versus evil thing, but that wasn't even the goddess's intention when she summoned you here. She literally just summoned you here because watching you guys fight does something cool for her world. It also kind of kills the weight of the decisions in the past Dissidia games because before, everybody was fighting desperately over and over and over again in an endless cycle to finally get to go home. And when they finally resolved the conflict and got to go home, they got summoned here and everybody's just kind of okay with it. Kind of makes it seem like no matter how hard everybody fights to just go back home and finish off the rest of their lives that it, another god could just summon them at any time and make it all pointless again. I digress though, because that is not the main problem with the story mode. You can't just sit back and enjoy the story mode. No, 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 no. This time around, in order to unlock story content, Square Onyx, you, you bunch of jerks, you yes. have to grind Please. arcade mode to world. get nodes the to unlock new world. story Just missions, or you have to play online matches, which <laughs> kinda <laughs> sorta take forever, we'll get onto that later. Chaos? Pretty much if you want to enjoy the story, you Chaos. cannot get out of having to grind for it. And the more story nodes you, you get, the longer it takes to get them I in the future. Adult. It is so tedious, and there's pretty much no fighting in the story mode, so essentially what you're doing is you're going off and you're grinding for 40 minutes to unlock the next cutscene in the story mode. It's completely nonsensical. I hate it. I hate it so much. It is the worst part of the game. And I don't really want to say that because despite all of its shortcomings, the story is actually kind of cute. Watching the characters interact with each other is still the best part of the entire game. Of course you're not just grinding to unlock story story missions. You can also unlock loot boxes now, and it's not pay with real money loot boxes, it's just like DBZ Fighters where you can unlock special stuff in game. Unfortunately, I've got a problem here too. To buy weapons and costumes and cool looking customization stuff for your characters, you can either A, get it randomly in loot boxes, which is very rare because there are 28 characters and you're probably not going to get stuff for the character you actually play or B, grind arcade and online so that you can afford to be able to buy the costumes and the weapons for the character you actually like. Winning an online match will net you, yeah, I'd say about 129 gil or so. How much does a costume cost? 15,000. 100 per match, and it costs 15,000 per costume, and each character has five costumes. That's not even getting into buying custom weapons. Where Onyx, I get that this is based on an RPG series, but you really didn't need this level of grinding to be in Dissidia in T. So I guess with all of that out of the way, there's really only one other thing to talk about, and that's online play. <sighs> Man, I really wish I had some good news for you here, but that's a little lackluster too. The biggest complaint here, of course, as everybody who's played this game before knows, is the wait time is way too long. It takes two to five minutes to get into a match, and you might be thinking, oh, two to five minutes, that's that's not too bad, but matches are only about three minutes long, so sometimes you'll be waiting double the t length of a match to get into a match. So in one hour of play, you will have spent maybe 20 to 25, possibly 30 if you're really lucky, minutes actually playing the game, and the other half of that hour is just spent waiting. I don't want to be too hard on Square Onyx for this because it's not all their fault. Uh, with Final Fantasy Dissidia coming out at the same time as Monster Hunter Worlds and Dragon Ball Z Fighters and a bunch of other stuff at the beginning of the year, I'm sure, there's just nobody playing. Maybe if they had released the game in December or something, this would have been fixed. I honestly don't know, but I do know that there's pretty much nobody playing online. The second issue is, do you remember before when I was talking about how characters have synergy with each other and, you know, there are these vanguards and assassins and marksmen and specialists? Well, you pick your character before you get matched with anybody else, so if you end up on a team with three marksmen and the enemy team has three assassins, 
well, that's it. You're gonna have a bad time. There's no way to change your character after you see your teammates. There's no way to actually know who your teammates are gonna be so you can choose a character that complements them. You just pick a character and you end up with a bunch of other random characters. It's just so frustrating because sometimes I'll get into a match and I'll be like, oh, I didn't know the other two were gonna pick assassins. If I had known they were gonna be assassins, then I'd love to be a vanguard right now, but oh well. The only thing that makes this even kind of okay is how long the wait times are. If they actually implemented a system where you got matched based on your character class, then the wait times would be longer, so that's a good thing, I guess. The lag is not the worst. Uh, I think out of every 10 matches, six of them would be okay, and I wouldn't have any lag at all, and then the other four, I'd have a little bit of lag here or there, somebody would quit. Honestly, I kind of wish lag were the biggest thing I had to complain about. Like, everything else was perfect, but the lag was just a little bit rampant. But no, we gotta get onto another problem. If one person on your team does not know how to play the game properly, and they rush off at the beginning of the match, then your team essentially loses, and there's not a whole lot you can do about it. I don't want to complain and say that a bunch of my losses are because somebody on my team doesn't know how to play. Honestly, my win rate is pretty good, but... It is a little frustrating that this is now specifically a 3v3 kind of thing where I, like, it, as soon as one of the teams reveals that one of the players doesn't know what they're doing, you can easily just focus them down and kill them three times for an easy victory. Like, yeah, the team can help that character and maybe stop that from happening as quickly, but if you've got somebody mashing buttons, if you've got somebody who doesn't know how to block or dodge or do anything special, then your team is at such a huge disadvantage that there's really not much you can do about it. Chances are you're gonna die protecting that person anyway, so it's a little rough. A lot of these issues will be ironed out if you can somehow manage to get two teammates, so maybe hit up Facebook or something and see if you can get two people on the Decidia forum, and then maybe you can put your headsets on and talk to each other during the match, and that'll make things a little bit easier on you. Honestly, I could go on forever complaining about some of the issues I have with the online, but somehow, ironically, the stuff that is so bare-bones about the online is what makes it so bearable right now. For example, I wish there was an option for 1v1 fighting so that I could just go up 1v1 against somebody else. That would be great, but... If they did include that option, chances are everybody would be playing that, the player base would be divided even more than it already is, and that 2-5 to five minutes for a match would probably go up to like 6-10. to 10. So thank god they didn't do that, because as much as I want it, it would end up making the experience worse. I, I don't know dude, I gotta start wrapping this up, I've been talking for way too long. This is a really hard game to talk about because even though I feel like there's a lot of great things about this game, there's just so many missteps taken here that it's very difficult to see this as a follow-up to the Dissidia games that I loved so much when I was younger. Even though it can't all be blamed on Square Onyx, like we can't blame Square Onyx for the fact that everybody's playing Monster Hunter Worlds right now or Dragon Ball Fighters, but we can definitely blame them for some things. Grinding to unlock story quests is a stupid idea, Square. Never ever try that again. If you do another game like this, try to make the gameplay a little bit faster. I really want to run across a big map again, grind on some rails, you know, really, really explore a stage. Also, I heard somewhere that there's 22 DLC characters planned for this game. First of all, I don't hear anybody complaining that Square Onyx has 20 DLC characters planned for this game, okay? No, everybody has to complain about Blay Blue Cross Tag, but absolutely nobody's over here complaining that there's 20 DLC characters coming to Dissidia. It's almost like it's not that big of a deal, and everybody just wanted to hop on a bandwagon. Oh my god. I'd like to see them bring back some of my OGs from Duo Decim. I'd like Laguna back. I'd like Yuna back. I'd like Tifa back. Maybe bring in some non-Final Fantasy characters. Wouldn't mind a little bit of Neku or Sora. That'd be cool. And even though I'm hesitating, I mean, I gotta get around to telling you guys how I feel. I'm gonna be transparent with you guys here. If this were a brand new IP that were just released, and it didn't have Dissidia's name, it didn't have the Final Fantasy brand behind it, and it was made by somebody who was not Square Onyx, this game would easily be a 4 out of 10 for me. So if you don't care about that stuff, if the Final Fantasy flair doesn't appeal to you, if you don't care about the story mode, if you don't care about any of that, you're just looking at gameplay alone, I could very easily see this game being a 4 out of 10. 
For me, that's the Good Ideas Horrible Execution score. With the Final Fantasy flavor that is still here, my heart really wants to give this game a 6 out of 10 because it's so different for a fighting game and it's innovative and new and shiny and I love the story, what little is actually there. The costume nods are so great and some of the dialogue is really good. Everything about this game that is the actual Final Fantasy fan service makes me want to give this game a 6 out of 10. So I think the only fair thing I can do as a game critic is to give this game a 5 out of 10. Average, middle of the road, liked it, but not impressed. A pretty tragic ends to my most anticipated game of 2018. Hey you, thank you so much for watching the video. If you enjoyed it, I'd really appreciate it if you left me a like. They help the channel grow and let me know that you want more of this kind of content in the future. The channel is currently being supported by these lovely folks on Patreon. You guys rock! If you have any thoughts on the video, of course leave them in the comment section below along with suggestions on what I should do next, but also answer this question to prove that you made it to the end of the video, if you feel like it. And finally, if you found this video by accident, then subscribe to stay up to date on the latest Kudo news. You can also hit the notification bell. Ringing the little bell will let you know when I upload a new video. See you next time!